Hello, this is Eva from Soul GPS. Welcome. Today, our topic by uh, demand is the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath. There's actually a lot of great information out there on the web. I'm going to, in fact, attach a link to the Wikipedia pages for a description of what is uh, sociopathy and psychopathy, or what is now um, termed antisocial um, personality disorder. So it's been sort of you know, the two have been put under this umbrella, which I think that it kind of softens uh, the uh, the meaning of it. Um, I don't know if it was um, you know, why it happened, why they did it that way. Um, some say that the people who are in charge of making these decisions as to how we uh, diagnose and uh, how we uh, quantify who belongs to which category um, is just uh, filled with people with cluster B personality disorders. So they're trying to do their best to smooth it out, to make it sound very mild, and also to completely actually do away with cluster B personality disorder. So something to keep in mind. Well, this it's, it's something that's very real. I encounter this on, a, on the daily when I speak with my clients and I hear their stories. Um, the stories are horrific. Uh, people's lives are changed. Uh, some feel utterly destroyed and then they have to go through a process of recovery. Uh, but a recovery is possible. It is what I call a brush with an evil force. You know, we fall into an Abyss, especially as a person who is empathic, you can kind of fall into the abyss, the gravity pool of a person who's hollow inside, and it makes you question everything about yourself. It can actually take you as far as um, you taking on some of the personality traits yourself, which sometimes there's not much other choice we have because in order to communicate we kind of have to get to their level and of course they're not going to move the needle so we have to be the ones who adjust our own communication style first then later our perception and finally eventually our entire paradigm and the way we look at the world so that it is close to the person that we are um, you know we've opened our heart to so it's it's a very destructive path we can go on uh, easily and then within sometimes weeks days even um, you notice tremendous changes inside yourself and the way that you relate to your loved ones everything begins to shift it's like you're entering this very dark void of, 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 of reality like things get distorted so if you've been in a relationship with a psychopath or a sociopath um, my heart goes out to you um, I have been and it's uh, it's it's a it's a mind fuck. I'm sorry for swearing, but um, I used to swear so much more in my older videos. I'm trying to keep it a little bit more PG, but I mean, there's no better way to put it that it is. Um, you know, it's absolutely crazy making the experience. So don't question yourself. You know, avoid falling into the um, the place where you. Uh, start to question whether it was you, you know, maybe you're, I mean, the people do this all the time. And, and the more empathic, the more I see that is that um, women, especially, they, they're they like, maybe I'm the sociopath. I'm like, well, darling, if you were the sociopath, we, you and I wouldn't be talking right now, first and foremost. You would never pay any attention to any of these videos. Uh, you would laugh it off. You would loathe any kind of a healing process or recovery process. It just doesn't, it, it doesn't work for, the, for those people. Those people are so grandiose. They're so above um, anything that isn't like them. Uh, that um, you know, it's there's just just stands no chance of getting any form of respect or humility um, that would lead them down the path of healing. So, so these are very dangerous characters. Um, the um, the research out there says that it's about uh, two to three percent of the population. It may seem like it's not a lot, but if you imagine, you know, hundred people in the room, you you say you're at a party, right? Hundred people in the room, it's, it's not a whole lot. It's like a Kind of like my loft here, um, crowded with people holding drinks and hanging out and talking. Probably I could fit a hundred people here, and uh, and so two or three are those dangerous types. And um, according to another research <clears throat> that I found on Psychology Today, excellent article. I'll look for it and I'll attach it to this video as well because it's it's fantastic. And it's uh, Sandra Brown who talks about. Um, you know how these people they just kind of steamroll through life and they will um, touch a lot of souls 
and they will create a lot of destruction. And if only, you know, um, each of them affects five other people, which usually the, the numbers are larger because they can't hold on to stable relationships. So they go through relationships quickly. And sometimes they have multiple relationships at once. Uh, that number is staggering. It's up to about 50 million, I think. Um, um, in the US alone. So these are huge numbers of people who get affected and many don't even realize it. So if you're here, if you're watching this video, uh, one thing I wanna say to you is that congratulations. While you may be feeling horrible right now, um, like you're infected with some dark virus, uh, at least you're aware and you've taken the step towards healing and educating yourself about this. So, so that's a very good thing. I was where you are. Uh, two and is it that two years ago almost two years ago so um no, a little bit more actually yeah it's been two two months no i'm sorry two years and three months ago i think just about so um you know i remember where, where my journey started and the difference as to where i am today you know after having done the work and i'm still continuing to do the work because there's so much to um, discover, you know, uh, and it's, there are lots of beautiful things to discover about yourself in this work. Uh, so it's, it's actually, uh, you know, it starts really dark and very heavy and daunting, but then later on it gets really exciting and, and fascinating. So you're on this journey, keep moving forward. Um, keep having faith in yourself, read up about it. Actually, Sandra's, um, book, um, women who love psychopaths, you know, it's, it's for women, but I think that, um, men could read it too. There are less uh, women psychopaths. They say it's, um, it's a much smaller ratio. It's about one to two men. So for every two psychopaths, there's one male psychopath, there's one female psychopath. Um, so yeah, it happens. It happens too. So, so who are these people and what is the difference, right? That's what, um, I, I, I'm known for long preambles, but that's what this uh, video is about. So, so I made a list of five um, five key differences, <clears throat> five key differences um, of these you, you know, that, that differentiates the two and I wanted to bring it up here. Some are more, some things are more obvious than others. Some are a little bit more abstract. So we're going to have to stretch our imagination a little bit. Um, it can be difficult to understand, you know, being a feeling, breathing, loving person can be very difficult to kind of like put yourself in that mindset because it's so vastly different from that of a normal, regular person, uh, but we'll, we'll do our best. So the first key difference between a sociopath and a psychopath, or rather psychopath and a sociopath, is that psychopath is, tends to be born. That's what the newest research says, is that there's something in the brain of a psychopath that is altered right from the start. So the development of a child um, is just not the same, you know, and, and based on what I've read, based on, how, based on how I understand it without going too deeply into the subject and making another, um, you know, hour long video, um, the difference is it's in the limbic brain. So we have three layers in our brain, in our brain structure. We have the oldest reptilian brain, which is the brain stem, and it has all of these instinctual um, mechanisms that are um, sort of programmed into it. It's about survival, it's, it's quick responses, quick reactions. It's kind of like you're putting your hand on a stove and you're taking it back. It's like, that's the brain stem. There's not much cognitive processing that goes on um, in that it's just quick, it's immediate. Then we have the next layer and that's the mammalian brain and that's where um, there is this um, that's where the mirror neurons are that's where you know a mother nursing a child that's where there's this this connection this attachment begins to form and it's an emotional brain and that's where we process uh, emotion and it's the sort of bridge between the cognitive and the physical that allows us to make sense of our world and give us guidance it's what I call the soul GPS right it gives us the guidance as to are we going the right direction or are we going the wrong direction and if your body is telling you that something's off and that might signal that oh maybe I shouldn't go there maybe I should back out and go somewhere else which is often the case with these relationships right is that your body is the first one to give you the signs that something's off so that's the mammalian brain and then finally we have uh, the um, the cognitive center the command center the executive center of our minds of the brain uh, which is the the, the cortex 
and the cortex is actually where empathy is born. So it is actually a very recent um, phenomenon and the development of our um, evolution. So one way to think about, I, I just, I don't know, this is just the way I think, I, I might be off in this, but I kind of think that empathic people are sort of on the cutting edge of the evolutionary, um, and the evolutionary impulse. You know, it's like um, the, the people who are much more stunted in that way, who don't have a way to relate empathically, openly, lovingly to other people, are those who are a little bit further back, uh, whether it is that they've been stunted in their childhood or whether on the evolutionary sort of genetic level, um, they haven't been able to develop. I don't know if it's if that's the way it is, but it kind of feels right to me when I think of it that way. So. Um, so, so a psychopath coming back to point one is born versus a sociopath is made. So a sociopath would be a person who early on in their childhood experiences a lot of pressure. Uh, maybe there's a lot of shame or some form of a trauma. And then let's say they get recruited by a gang. You know, they're full of anger and angst and anxiety and they're just aimless. And then the gang takes them and it raises them and it's teaching them systematically uh, to kill off their empathy center, to, to anesthetize it, to desensitize it. And they could be taking them to, you know, commit acts of um, uh, criminal acts or acts of um, violence and slowly that person gets conditioned to doing that and they identify, their, their identity is deeply vested with that group, they identify with them. So eventually they become like that themselves, they become cruel, um, they become um, callous, um, they don't have feelings for other people, in fact they have nothing but disdain. And that's the feelings that, that you get if you're in a relationship with that person. There will be an outward projection of charm because that's they've learned is the only way to get their way. If they were, if they were really to show their true colors, everybody would be able to see who they really are, and they would run away, right? So they have to have that layer of charm and you know this way of evoking empathy within you, within the person that they're talking to by telling sad stories uh, from their childhood, talking about their traumas and that also then serves as a way of uh, you rationalizing um, their behavior later on when you're starting to question and you get into enter this cognitive dissonance zone within when you're just wondering is it me, is it them, what's going on here, it's like your body knows something's off but you don't know what it is and you want the dream to continue on so so you start to rationalize and then you can think of oh well they told me this story that they were hurt and they were sexually abused or really severely beat up by the father and the father was an alcoholic and he left them and abandoned the family and blah 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 on it goes I know I've been there I've been there so I've been told these stories by these ruthless awful people so born versus made is the first difference. Second difference is, I call it sloppy versus strategic. So psychopaths, because they don't know anything else, they tend to be kind of sloppy in the way that they go about their business. They are reckless. They make a lot of mistakes. They're the people who are more likely to be caught and put in jail for their crimes than a sociopath who is much more strategic in, in his or her scheming games and sometimes will plan for years before executing on the plan. They have a lot of patience, so that's what makes them very dangerous. They have a lot of patience. They, they, they enjoy the preparation. They enjoy the, you know, setting up the board or the, the dominoes, right? And then they just make that one move and then everything goes and then they back out and they watch it and they just kind of like, you know, they have like this internal, um, dopamine orgasm if I were if I were to call it that it's just it's it's sick so they love it they enjoy it they love the game um, they love the build-up but again psychopaths tend to be a little bit more sloppy they make a lot of mistakes whereas a sociopath is just on the point and a lot of white-collar crimes actually uh, there's lots of sociopaths that are attracted to powerful leadership positions and they are they are I'm not saying that all CEOs of big corporations are sociopaths, not at all. But even those people, I think, could get conditioned over the years, you know, by their exposure to power and, you know, acting in a way that doesn't take into consideration the well being of other people since they have like thousands of people working for them, right? So, in a sense, if you think of it, you know, to think about, and I'm not excusing them right now, but if you were to think about, you know, every time you have to lay someone off, 
that you go home and you uh, you think about it, that would be me. That's why I'll never be a, a CEO because I would not be able to do it. I would be thinking about it for months and feel horrible and I couldn't do it. But these people, it comes easy to them. They just, you know, they fire people left and right. They, they, they close out. Um, you know, entire departments to, to save money and this, you know, it's a very different mentality. But I can see how over the years somebody, you know, sort of getting on that career track would become, would, would, would take on some of these sociopathic traits. Um, and then there are some people who do it on purpose. They just love it. They, they enjoy. And that's the difference between, I think, somebody with traits versus a full-blown sociopath is they really love it. They really love looking in the face and in the eyes of whether it's a lover or whether it is, um, you know, somebody who works for them, uh, where they ha feel like they have power over them and they just love to give a little hope and then to take it away, to snatch it back and see the fear, the disappointment, the, the pain uh, written all over that person's face. It is really, truly disturbing. It is disturbing. Like, for instance, I think that that's the difference between narcissists. It could be a different video, but narcissists would still have some level of um, remorse or regret or there's some more feeling there, you know. Um, sometimes they do things because um, they think it's the right thing. They just, um, you know, they're, they're selfish. They're very much in their bubble. But... A typical narcissist is not going to sit back and, and scheme and just can't wait to bring it and to hurt somebody. They just, this is who they are. They, sometimes they can't help themselves. There's a mixture of unconscious behavior with conscious behavior. Again, I'm not in any way condoning this or trying to sound like it's like they're better. It's all bad and it's all unhealthy and it's all highly, highly destructive. And if you identify yourself being in, um, you know, in contact with that person, you're starting to feel the effects on your body. You're feeling tired. You don't know what's going on with your world. Everything seems distorted and weird. Run away, quit your job do something else, leave that person, open your heart to something better and uh, greater. Um, the, the pain of staying because you're trying to avoid the pain of, of facing your loneliness and your fears uh, is much greater. Um, it's the, the price you're paying is just, it's, it's unbelievably uh, expensive to stay in that relationship on all levels, spiritual, physical, emotional, mental, financial. So don't do it. Um, get yourself out of those situations. So sloppy versus strategic is number two. Number three, and here's when we're a little bit uh, abstract. It's kind of this hollow, dark um, energy, I don't know, as, um, of, of, a, of a psychopath. Like a psychopath is almost like there's this shell. Imagine like an egg that is empty, that you just you blew it all out, the insides out, and there's nothing there. And you can, you can see it in the psychopathic stare when they just kind of look at you blank, you know, uh, or they're, they're trying to, they're already imagining the sick things in their mind of things they'll do to you. I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible. Um, but, um, but there's this, this hollowness, this coldness. It's almost like you're standing next to a brick of ice. Whereas with a sociopath, there is still this darkness, but there, I feel like there's more substance to it. Like there's, there's this activity. There is this there's this charm, there's this, this, this layer of substance that makes it feel more valid, like it's more legitimate, like you think you're talking to a legitimate person, even though your radar is still picking up, like something's off here, with a psychopath you just feel cold, it's just like you've just entered this deep cave and the whole world fades away and there's nothing but just you and them and you're a little scared, but you're also a little fascinated. It's like this fear and fascination play. Like you're just like, wow, what is this? Right? And sometimes, and some of us, the healing impulse might turn on. It's very deep. It's, it's deeply, some, it's, it's, it's deep and subconscious. So you might not be aware of it, but it's almost as if you want to like go in and infuse this person with your light, infuse them with your love, like save them, rescue them, heal them. And it's what they prey on. And that's why a lot of these people are going to spin stories and tell you things to entice you to enter their world and they will play this victim because that is what what really turns our empathy centers on and that's what they're looking for. 
So, uh, but it's not like, for example, again, with a, with a narcissist, narcissists are looking for empathic people to come in and do things for them, you know, to be an extension of their ego. Whereas a sociopath and a psychopath would do it to control you, to have total, complete power over you, and then to destroy you. So this is a level, this is the next level up or next level down. One, you can look at it that way too. Okay, number four, the psychopaths tend to be more dysfunctional whereas sociopaths are more functional. So um, very rarely that a psychopath has a high level job and is very successful in what they do. You know, it could be a leadership position also in church. It could be a leadership position in a, definitely a corporation or, you know, a teacher, um, you know, somebody who's even like a writer, you know, an artist, um, um, somebody who is just has a lot of notoriety. Like, don't be fooled by that. You know, these people are highly intelligent. They don't have the conscience breaks that we do sometimes. Like they, they have no problem walking over other people to get their prize, to win, to 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 meet their goals. They do, they they don't worry about those things. Like for me, for instance, you know, before I make a decision about something, I have to consider everybody and my neighbors to make sure that I'm not gonna hurt them. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, I'm working on that, so it's not so out of control, but that's the difference. And they, they, don't, they don't think about it that way. They completely don't worry about destroying people in the process. So again, uh, psychopaths, more dysfunctional, they tend to have just mess um, in their space. Uh, they're not really orderly. Uh, they're, again, it's that sloppiness, you know, in their, in their relationships, um, can't hold down to a job, constantly complains, you know, everybody's, it's everybody else's fault, not um, that kind of an approach, um, massive victim ego um, versus a sociopath, kind of almost proud of who they are, really digging it, you know, um, and very highly functional. So not having those conscience remorse breaks, they just steamroll through life and um, get their way. Okay, and finally, number five, which kind of ties in with number four, is that psychopaths tend to be broke. Uh, again, that, that dysfunction really bleeds into their financial uh, sphere and they're, they're always struggling with things um, versus a uh, psychopath can be very successful, even could be a doctor, could be a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Yeah, that happens too. Um, very scary scenario to consider, but yeah, that happens. So, so these are, these are the five main differences. So again, I'm just going to recap, um, psychopath versus sociopath. So the first thing I'll say relates to psychopathy, the second to sociopathy. Number one, born versus made. Number two, sloppy versus strategic. Number three, hollow versus substantive. Uh, number four, dysfunctional versus functional and number five broke versus successful or has some some semblance of that in his life or her life so that's that now something to really remember if you again have identified this person you're still trying to give them benefit of doubt remember these people are like this through and through it's not that it's just a slice of their personality it's their entire personality if the fracture goes all the way to the core these people have no empathy no conscience don't ever count on the fact that if you're going to break down and cry in front of them that they will change their approach they will not they're going to actually love that that's how they get their supply that's how they get their fuel they have very shallow affect so no subtle emotions of say um you know like you stand in front of a painting and you're just in awe right or you uh, pick up some delicate um, um, sensations of, of love and uh, of trust and these things they just hate that they just stomp all over that they think it's beneath them uh, there's a, a feeling of darkness hollowness it's kind of like sucks you in like a black hole coldness uh, but then the outside layer of course has to draw you in like a, like a true predator draws you in uh, charm grandiosity and tremendous intelligence and that grandiosity I find uh, in my work with some of the people is what can actually take a person who has been sort of starving uh, for attention for affection uh, they've been feeling less than because they have you know their their self-esteem and their self-worth have been beat down over the years by those characters so they're they're in a compromised position and they meet one of those grandiose characters and by association they feel like they they themselves get an ego boost so be careful if that's something that you identify with it's not something to shame yourself uh, about it's just something to be aware of and the other thing to be really aware of is do you project 
truth is we all do, but to what degree do you project? So a lot of the times what happens is you meet one of those people, they tend to present themselves quite well, and then you project your idea of who you just met on those people before you even met them. So you think you're with an amazing, uh, talented, benevolent, um, great person with whom you have so much in common, but the truth is actually really dark and, and very scary. So try to give yourself some space and some distance. Don't fall in for people. I know it's easier said than done, but it's something to practice. It's a great muscle and skill to have is to hold your heart close to your chest, in your chest, and uh, be open-minded, talk to people, explore who they are, ask questions, do your own investigation, but once you're getting a weird hints, really pay attention and give yourself time to get to know somebody. Don't rush in, uh, you know, don't project that fantasy. It will probably turn on. When you meet somebody unique, captivating, it is what happens. So don't feel like you're flawed. Again, don't shame yourself, don't guilt yourself. Just let it play out, you know, see yourself, um, you know, married to this person, having kids whatever that, that vision may be, or you see yourself exploring all sorts of things. You seem to have all these things in common. Maybe you can go to um, museums and concerts to get, you know, it's like that stuff just, just, un, just unfolds in the mind. It's okay. Just notice that you have it and just say to yourself, oh, okay, I'm doing that. All right. Well, let's now take a step back. Let's breathe. You're going to feel like you're almost like pulling something away from something sticky that's trying to like, that's magnetizing you. Just fight against that a little bit, pull yourself back, allow some space between you and that person and just breathe and tend to your life, tend to your world. Um, do something that makes you happy, makes you excited. Work on your life purpose. Clean your space, you know, uh, buy yourself some flowers, go to a yoga class, go on a walk, uh, call up a friend, you know, tend to your world, build your life, and the more of a life you have, the less susceptible you'll be to falling into the gravity zone of these characters. So I'm gonna leave it at this. Hopefully uh, you liked this video, it was helpful to you, it helped to validate your experience. If so, I'm glad because that's the purpose that I wish for this uh, video to serve. I'm sending you lots of my love. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your likes and subscriptions. It helps to spread this information to more people. So every time you do that, know that you're contributing to growing this community, which is my goal to educate and help other people. So thank you so much again, sending you lots of love, and I will uh, catch up with you in another film. Bye-bye.